private companies that are high growth, don't make money, that have huge ambitions or could fail. It's a very, very opaque, you know, valuation. And somebody has to help entrepreneurs who are amazing at starting the companies sort of tell the vision and then actually get credit for it. The process of telling that story is really important. And you'd be shocked how few entrepreneurs actually take the time or even are patient enough to tell all the things that they know to someone else. The capital that we raised for entrepreneurs literally changed the company. So it's not just money, right? Be like, oh, why should I pay you just to get some money? I could get it myself. If you don't get it, you could be out of business. If you do get it at a good valuation, you might take twice as much. And that could be the thing that saves your company. We went out to raise money for Revolut. The prior round was like 5 billion valuation. And we came in a year later and got 33 billion. Instead of raising 200 million, they raised a billion 250. That's a lot of extra money to raise for 2% dilution. What they've been able to do with that has literally just changed the face of the company. Welcome to Turpentine Finance, a podcast where we talk with top founders and finance leaders about what it takes to architect success. Our guests speak candidly about big business inflections, market curveballs, and how they approach decision-making so that you have the tactics and mental models for when the pressure is on. I'm your host, Sasha Orlov founder, CEO, and self-professed finance nerd. You ready? Let's dive in. All right. Hi, everybody. I have had the fortune to learn some amazing lessons from some amazing people behind closed doors. And Steve is hands down one of the most incredible capital whisperers in tech. And usually he doesn't hold back. So this should be a great episode for every founder and every CFO and probably a lot of board members out there. But when we think about financials and storytelling and how they come together to make a company exciting, there is literally nobody better. Steve has seen it all. He started his career at GE during the famous Jack Welch days. He became the head of global financial technology group and investment banking at this small firm called Goldman Sachs during the first dot-com heyday here. And then he started his own investment bank called FT Partner. So Steve, welcome to the show. Sasha, you are the man. Thank you so much for having me on. This is so much fun. It's been a while. I wish we were in person, but it's great to see you, buddy. You too. Thanks for coming in. All right. So before we dive in, tell us about what FC Partners is and maybe just some of the biggest transactions just to give the audience a sense of what FT Partner does. Thanks for asking. I mean, so FT Partners is short for Financial Technology Partners. So we're an investment bank we're exclusively focused on the broad fintech universe. We do it on a global basis. So we're literally active on deals on six or seven continents at any given time. We've got 200 and something people between New York, San Francisco, and London. Uh, and uh, yeah, in terms of deals, look, I mean, they're probably the more, more interesting deal I've ever worked, most interesting deal I've ever worked, I think was a Revolut transaction. We raised a billion 250 for Revolut at 33 billion and just have watched the thing grow and grow and grow since then. It's one of the best companies on the planet. So we're very proud about that. We just raised a bunch of money for built in the prop tech space around rewards and loyalty for landlords and renters. We raised 100 plus plus million for a company called Tools for Humanity and WorldCoin, uh, which is a Sam Altman company. You guys may know. So Sam hired us on that one with Alex over there. And and that was a blast. So just and the thing is, like, we, we spent a lot of time with some amazing entrepreneurs helping raise capital. We do a lot of M&A, too. So we sold Divi to Build.com, a company we were just talking about, uh, for $2.5 billion. And, and then we do a lot of IPO advisory. We do the IPO for... Avid Exchange, $600 million, Green Sky, $1 billion. And so, yeah, we're advisors to these great companies that are growing and just having a lot of fun. So that's that's kind of the business. We're all, one thing is we're always on the sell side, Sasha. So we're not really on the buy side too much. So we're helping entrepreneurs, founders, companies tell their story and get sort of proper credit for the businesses that they're building from the investor universe, who is often a little... A little short-sighted sometimes, and they need to kind of absorb really what a company is. And we've gotten really good at helping companies tell their stories. Yeah, gotten really good. Like, amazing. Something that a lot of people just don't do very well for a variety of reasons. Let's get to start. What got you excited about either capital raising or sort of sell-side M&A? I, look, I started my career off of Goldman. I was there from 95 to 02 almost. And the Goldman was well known during the, the mid 80s, 90s buyout craze. And so you, you get the listing. So I'm kind of famous for saying that. And I, I credit my mom a lot for that. But so between Goldman Sachs and my mom, I got this bug to be on the sell side. But the other thing I figured out 
And I've never heard anyone really articulate it this way, but I, I think that the hardest thing in life to value, honestly, is a high growth tech company with, let's just say with little or no earnings, but big prospects, right? And you, you take a company that something's coming, it's got zero revenue. Why is it worth $200 million, right? You get a company with a hundred revenue, it could be worth $5 billion, right? Because it's just like, what is there that's more intangible than something like that, right? Like, I mean, oil, everyone knows what that's worth. Pork bellies, that's pretty much defined. Even high-end art, you've got Sotheby's and these guys in, okay, this Renoir, there's been a bunch of Renoir sold, elite cars, whatever it is, or buildings. There's comps to everything, right? But like private companies that are high growth, don't make money, that have huge ambitions or could fail, it's a very, very opaque, you know, valuation. And somebody has to help entrepreneurs who are amazing at starting the companies sort of tell the vision and then actually get credit for it from someone that, that, that isn't them. Right. And so we help people do that. So I just, that is so fun to do. And, and it's very rewarding that whether it's you're raising capital or selling a company and really helping people achieve their visions and their dreams. And I've seen the capital that we raised for entrepreneurs literally change the company. So it's not just money, right? Be like, Oh, why should I pay you just to get some money? I could get it myself. It's like, well, if you don't get it, you could be out of business. If you do get it at a good valuation, you might take twice as much. And that could be the thing that saves your company, right? We went out to raise money for your Revolut. The prior round was like 5 billion valuation. And we came in a year later and got 33 billion. Instead of raising 200 million, they raised a billion 250. That's a lot of extra money to raise for 2% dilution. What they've been able to do with that has literally just changed the face of the company having that kind of capital and that kind of confidence. And then you see like a Klarna who was trying to get capital and ended up not getting the 60 billion they're looking for. They got four and a half or five. So it's like the tale of two cities. If you really do it right, it's, it can be, it can be a lot of fun. So, but it's challenging. Nothing's easy. The market's been tough as we know, like it, yeah, these rounds aren't just getting done by snapping your fingers for it. And they never have, but things have been challenging. Let's dive in a little bit there. I, I, you've probably seen more successes and failures than, than probably anybody in tech for private to public reasons. So let's let's dive into like, what is kind of the process like of going from like a good capital raise to a, a great capital raise? So thinking about like, founders obviously want to pull off a great, great capital raise. What are some of the themes of things that make a, a raise go really well? Well, let's start with some basics. I mean, number one, we only work with, I would say, very good to excellent companies, right? So if we don't believe in a company's business model, we won't take it on. We've become a little bit like a VC firm where I think last year, or maybe it was a year before, we looked at like 12 or 13 or 1400 potential transactions to take on and literally took on 25, right? So the one thing I would say is like anything that we're ever working on, we would profess is a very good company that has a big vision, a great entrepreneur, a great team, are probably already good investors in there or else we would probably not take it on, right? So start with that, right? So I think in order to think about what's a good caliper is or a bad caliper is, you like to think of what, what kind of company am I starting with to begin with? Yeah, you know, very good companies. And by the way, it doesn't mean they've all got massive revenue or massive profits. I mean, Tools for Humanity or also known as WorldCoin had no revenue at all and we helped raise money at two and a half billion dollars and so there's a story behind, well, how does that happen, right? Well, maybe every company with no revenue with a good story could, could raise it to an FBA. Well, obviously not, right? So the story that people has to be worthwhile telling a big story about, right? Companies like Amazon or WhatsApp or Atari, these were small, tiny companies. I love, I love watching, and I, I probably obsess on it too much, watching the early, early, early videos of Amazon in his little tiny office dressed like a total goober with Amazon like spray painted on like a piece of paper and or Jack Ma in his his living room with like six people and he's like professing to them we're gonna be the biggest thing on the planet. He's like literally in his like little living room with no money. And we kind of try to say, okay, how how would those guys tell those stories and get credit for it? And unfortunately a lot of people though that that moment in time, I mean, they they aren't able to really tell the stories to the right people. Like Bezos tells the story all the time, how he would had to scrap together like 50,000 from here or there to get a million or two million bucks early on and probably gave away a huge percentage of the company. I mean, he still did okay. Let's, let's say he did okay. But like, 
we we talk about like deal DNA and and deal strategy a lot at the firm where what's the DNA of a given situation? Who are the people? What's the setup? What's the company doing? What's the competition? What's the market look like? Well, there's like we always think of there's like like a thousand little things that make up a situation, right? And so you assess all those things and say, okay, how do I take this particular set of facts at this moment in time, which is a fact in and of itself, right? And that changes day to day. And then and then tell the story. So sometimes I don't want to bore the audience, but sometimes it's a 20 year story, right? Something like a world coin is sort of like, you know what? You have to kind of like think about where's AI going? Where are deep fakes going? Is every transaction in the world going to be done against a person may or may not be the human you think it is, right? And this utopian or non utopian world 20 years from now, everything being effectively AI driven and deep fakes, and you, you literally won't nose on the other side of any transaction ever. But you really, really need an identity network. So to believe in stuff like that, you got to think fairly long term. And that was sort of the story behind like a world point. Other businesses need to tell a good three year story. And that's enough to get people jazzed to get the right kind of a deal done. So we're sort of like helping entrepreneurs tell their stories, like I said before. But think about it. Like I, I tell entrepreneurs all the time, look, you have been obsessing about this business, obsessing about it with you and your team. When you wake up, when you're dreaming, when you're on the toilet, when you're in the shower, when you're driving, like, and and you've developed so many nuanced thoughts in your brain and so many neurons flashing exactly kind of where you're going, or you have a relatively clear vision of that. And but like, how do you get that? The unfortunately, the Vulcan thing of like having you know, me put my hand on your head and, and the investor said it, it doesn't work that way. Somehow, I get. The thousand zillion things in your head that are firing that give you the supreme confidence, like an Elon Musk to go create Tesla or SpaceX or whatever, right? How do you get that from your head to someone else and get credit for it? And that's kind of what we do, right? Say, so like, what is the process of getting that information from one mind to another, right? And we, we joke around like PowerPoint and Excel, right? And take all the things you're thinking. I would say, write them down in a very concise and robust way and make sure someone else can read it. And we kind of view that storytelling as almost like computer code, right? So your version 1.0 looks like this. If you have more time, you'd create more pieces to it. There's a GUI layer. And, and the story keeps getting better and better. And the more the users use it, the more you can refine it. So if someone comes in and says, well, that's great, but what about this, right? You say, oh my God, that's a good point. I should think about that and I'm going to create a module. So we tend to be sort of not these like super fluffy storytellers where everything is, oh, trust me, trust me, trust me. We're like very much in the grind, in the weeds. Well, what are all the reasons that this, this, and this might come true? What are all the reasons that could not come true and be very earnest about it and let the investors sort of make up their mind? And the truth is like a lot of these deals, a lot of investors turn their nose up. They look, I just, it's a great story. I, I just, I don't know enough about the space. I can't get up to speed. There's no time. And someone's already got two term sheets in on it. So you know, some of the deals go really fast, some take longer, but uh, the process of telling that story is is really important. And and you'd be shocked how few entrepreneurs actually take the time or even are patient enough to, to tell all the things that they know to someone else. So we're really enabling that to happen. How long does something like this take? Like just to set expectations, I, I, I go in, how long is the process of storytelling? Building the story. It, it, it little depends on how complex the business is and how ready they are to begin with. There's always like, where do you want to be and where do you start, right? And the more more you've got already done and the better. But like, it's probably, it could be a month or two, right? We've had some situations where guys come to us or women and say, look, I don't need anybody right now at all, right? And 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 I don't need you guys at all because I can raise money myself. I say, okay, well, and I'm not going to raise money for a year. And then after a few conversations, they'll say, look, okay, fine. I get what you guys are doing why don't you take a year to help me get ready, right? And then we can kind of do like lots and lots more things of not only just telling the story, but like, who's the best investor in the world? They, these days, it's become super complex who's the right investor, right? Because they're, first of all, investing is very global. You've got investors from all over the Middle East, all over China and, and Asia and Europe, all really investing in every other geography. So the the the, the combinations of permutations of who may invest in what deal on a given day is pretty pretty widespread now with the, the you know, evolution of family offices and hedge funds coming into space and and big asset managers doing pre-IPO rounds and I'm not just talking about a 21 this stuff's still happening right 
So it's, it's usually like a needle or two in a haystack that, that ultimately are the best investors for you. The problem is entrepreneurs and, and their two VCs often think like, we know enough people. We, we live in Sand Hill Road. We, we, you know, I can call this guy or that guy and get a deal done. But like, do you really think that part time in your spare time, you're going to be able to really, truly find the best investor in the world for this particular story that has the domain expertise, that has the passion, that has the time, that is open to dreaming with you and supporting you in the journey. So we know so many investors that it's insane. Like we have a 15 person team that all they do all day long is travel the world, talking to investors and you know, go to TechCrunch, you go to PitchBluff. I mean, there's like a fund a day created, right? So there's 300 a year, if, if not more. So, so it, it's almost impossible for any one human being, even if it was your full-time job as an entrepreneur to know VCs, you would, you would not even be able to know a fraction of them. So we know almost all of them and we know what their preferences are and everything else. And so, um, but by the way, we don't call them all. We have a lot of insights and we're using sort of, I would call it minor AI to figure out who looks at what and who wants what and who's a good fit. But we also do an odd thing, which is we kind of get our clients out there on the stage a lot. So we may do a webinar with them on there. We may do a research report with them embedded in, just get their name around the world and, and help them tell the story in a non-deal environment so that people are calling them, right? And so you kind of bring the man that I sort of have this mental vision of, of a haystack with a couple of needles in it. And we're like this magnet that's just like sucking the needles out, right? Without ever diving into the haystack, right? And that's that's really valuable as well. So it's a combination of storytelling, finding the investors, negotiating all this kind of stuff to get the right outcome. But I have this other sort of funny thing where we'll we'll sort of tell investors or tell tell clients, I should say, what's your priority? And oftentimes the priority isn't the best price. It's a high quality investor at a fair price, at a reasonable pace. Someone's going to treat me well on the board. Someone's going to add value. We're rarely trying to maximize valuation. That, that sometimes happens. You get a good valuation. It's such a good company. But um, we usually try to optimize for something other than valuation if the entrepreneurs are really thoughtful about it. Because like valuation is the easiest thing to maximize for, but finding high quality people if they're all the criteria. So so anyway, it's it's I don't want to drone on all day, but that's it's complicated. And you know, people think it's sometimes simple, but it's quite nuanced. Hey, we'll get back to the conversation in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey everyone, Eric here. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from our AI and investing cluster of podcasts, to shows that drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, investors, and influencers, like Econ 102 with Noah Smith. We're launching new shows every week, and we're looking for industry-leading sponsors. If you think that might be you and your company, email me at ericaturpentine.co. That's E-R-I-K at turpentine.co, and let's partner together. I do agree, and I, I think there's a, a myth out there that it's just pure network. Like, you're just connecting me, and I'm doing my thing, and I, I know what's going on. Because I'm a founder, I have an ego, I get it. I know, I, I think I'm amazing, I think I'm the best at everything. But the world has become way more complicated. There's way more types of capital and distribution of capital over time. So there is a really compelling reason to take a company who's part of their business is just knowing who is out there and who does what. So I, I really wanted that. But I also want to dispel that like that's the primary value because there's so much of the emotional appeal of a company and, and the vision to attract the right investor. So let's focus in a little bit on not just like the network and let's assume that that's true because, well, we know it is and I know it is and so what is it? What what percent of founders who come in the story that they start with is the story that they end with? Never, never, <laughs> because they a lot of times they haven't really developed the story out more than like six or nine months, right? Like I mean, maybe they know the end point, but like, but the only points they're thinking about on a daily basis is the next six months, right? And we've raised money for companies where they really only had like a one year like plan, right? And everything beyond that was like kind of a mess, right? The product plan was, but like, if you look at companies like, like a Square's, so Square wasn't a client, let's just say, it, it, but like their whole thing was, we've got a dongle, that's great, but then we're going to move up to more 
bigger restaurants, that we're going to do cash app, that we're going to do square cash loans and this and that, right? And so if you, if you get credit for all those arcs, the things that you're going to do, or at least part of them, that that's really, really important. But in the early days, Square never got any credit for maybe even potentially creating a cash app, right? Or maybe even potentially getting into lending, right? Or potentially being a behemoth company, right? I use PayPal a lot as an example. Like PayPal, for all of its hype as to the PayPal mafia and all this, you know, stuff, it's like, okay, well, they sold the whole business for $1.2 billion after raising hundreds of millions of dollars and going public. I mean, it wasn't that much enterprise value created actually in the actual creation and sale of PayPal to eBay. It was the eBay synergies, right? If you think about that moment in time, eBay was really a very, very widely recognized and used marketplace around the world. But there was, and there was multiple ways of paying on it. But like when they bought PayPal, they kind of promoted PayPal as the, the only real way to pay. They did have to have a couple other like hokey ways of paying, but PayPal was really the big way. And by getting, forcing every single consumer that wants to buy something online at eBay to use PayPal and forcing every seller to take PayPal, it created a network effect that actually could have been easily predicted in the sale of the company to eBay. So I always say like, I can't believe eBay only sold for a billion dollars. It should have been 5 billion, right? And, and had they paid 10 billion for it, they still would have made 10 times their money, right? Or 20, yeah. You know. So it's, it's like that, but that's a good example of something that I think was a, an asset that was significantly undersold in a moment in time and billions of dollars left on the table. And had they maybe sold it for 4 billion, Elon Musk would have owned a lot more of Tesla and SpaceX than he, than he does. Right. So again, another gentleman who does not need any money, but picking some funny examples for, 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 for clarity. But like, so I just think the art of like telling that PayPal story to eBay could have resulted in a far greater outcome for, for the guys that were holding PayPal public company stock at a billion dollars at that point in time. So I, I think there's a similar feeling amongst a lot of founders where they do have these huge ambitions and, and we're so caught up in the sort of day to day because that's kind of how it consumes so much of our life. Are there any lessons learned in how to think about extending the narrative to talk about what the future potential could be. How do you go about doing this? Coming in a business founder who's telling the six month story and really needs to tell the three month story or 10 months, three year or 10 year story. I think is this early? It's with, you gotta always think about the, the, the situational or deal DNA, as I say, right? And, and I, I should sort of just make it really clear. We talk here about these like small companies that can be huge, but the, there's plenty of examples such as a company's got like 10 or 20 million in revenue and it should just sell when it gets to 40 million in revenue for 500 million bucks or whatever. And everyone goes home, everyone's made money, everyone's happy. Not every business has to tell a crazy 20 year story and, and get some crazy valuation and you're a failure if you don't create a triple unicorn type of company. So I think the stuff I'm saying applies to slow growth companies, high growth companies, companies that will have an ambition to get to 500 million or even a hundred million, whatever, right? So it's just like, what? And that's where, that's where I think like every, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And so it, that's not us, right? So we look at every single thing that you get hit and say, what's the right instrument to hit it with? And how do you help this person get to where they want to get to? Part of the, the biggest part of the DNA situation, the deal is, is the founder and their, where they are in their life. What's their risk tolerance? What have they been through? How did they get there? And so this is a huge part of the DNA for us is like, they really want to go for the gold. And maybe they want to go for broke on risking the capital raise and valuation. And usually we're trying to coach them that that's not the right thing to do, but like get, get a high level of certainty, get a deal done, move on and, and then build a big, big company or build the company the size that they want. Right. But sometimes we have founders of entrepreneurs that are doing this in their fifties, right. Or even 60 and like, okay, in order to do a 20 year plan, it's not very credible that you're going to be the guy doing it. Maybe bring a seat or, you know, or do you, maybe you want to retire. It's like, we, 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 we think through those factors. Did someone just get a divorce? Is someone sick? Are the investors tired? We get brought in at like absolutely completely different moments in time for different companies. And so everything got to be assessed the right way. But I'll tell you one thing. I, I, I love to address this point. A lot of people will say, why do I need an investment banker to raise capital? Right. And, and I think in a lot of respects, they can be right. Cause not a lot of investment bankers have a lot of experience raising capital. Right. I think we, we look at. Even some of the largest banks in the world, the, the big bulge bracket brand, brand name banks, 
they're really not actually that good at raising private capital. If the company's amazing and you can call the top 20 investors and get a deal done, anybody, my grandma could do that, right? But if it gets any harder than that, like you want a better valuation, you want you want a special kind of investor, you want strategic, they, they don't want to put the work in to do it, right? If there isn't a machine that you could kind of put these, the meat grinder, you could put these things in and just get them done. If there's not a tried and true meat grinder process, then then if it's not cookie cutter, then don't go to a big bank, right? So they say, oh, go to a small bank. No, well, small banks don't have the equipment. They don't have the big private capital markets team. They may not have the research team. They may not. So it, it, there's really, you really got to make sure, and it doesn't have to be FD partners, of course, for every deal, just in fintech and SBS. But like, it doesn't have to be, as a joke, it, it doesn't have to be us and every deal, of course, right? But it, you, you need to make sure that that banker has their shit together, knows what they're doing, has a team, has raised a lot of private capital and is quite good at doing it. And you won't find that many people that have done it. If you interview a banker and say, hey, just casually over lunch, say, just what the last 10 deals you worked on of any kind, right? A lot of them are going to say, well, I, I just did the big Capital One kind of discover deal, or I did a recap of a huge company. I did the spinoff of PayPal. I did IPO for Square. I did the down round for Klarna. I mean, like, or I did a, a, I worked in the FTX bankruptcy or whatever. Right? It's this hodgepodge which is brew of deal types that they worked on. But you notice they not not every deal they worked on was a sell side mandate to tell a complicated story, you know, to someone skeptical, right? I guarantee I didn't by the way, I didn't work on Capital One Discover, but I guarantee it was, you know, the good old boy CEOs got together one day and said, let's get a deal done. And then they called up the bankers and said, you know, hey guys, put the stamp on this thing and get it done. Right. That's not a skill set that applies very well to helping puzzle raise its next $150 million round, right? Or so and neither is working on the FTX bankruptcy, neither is taking, neither is spinning off PayPal, neither is selling XYZ company to, to, to GE. So it's, it's the skill set of actually being involved in only, only, only ever selling complicated assets and companies, I should say. Uh, that's rare to ever find anyone that that's all that they do their whole entire life. I would probably not hire a banker unless I hired somebody who did it 24 seven, right? For their career. Well, there's, there's an easy analogy in the startup world in the early days, kind of like Y Combinator. Like if you don't think Y Combinator is going to increase the chances of success, then like, why bother? But nobody that does YC that had a chance of doing YSS like looks back and goes, God, I really wish I like had optimized for that little tiny, like whatever nugget. I think there's a similar analogy here where YC makes you think better, bigger, and makes you more ambitious and helps you unlock your potential in a way that I think you do. I mean, even just when you're saying like, oh, what's puzzle going to do with the next 150 million? Like I'm immediately going, God, I could go so much faster. We could build this and build that. There's this like excitement that comes up. Bringing that back to to reality, like there's like you, you mentioned sort of Revolut said, maybe they come in and say, well, they could raise 200 million on their own and we helped them raise over a billion right along the way. And I know Nick is like one of the most ambitious founders of all time, hits every checkbox and stuff like that. So how do you help unlock that in your meetings? Like I, I immediately am like, all right, I think I can go out and maybe raise 50 million on my own. But holy shit, like if I could raise 150, like I could do I could build a much bigger company way faster. How do you how do you unlock that out as a founder? It's so exciting. Well, a couple of things. One, I would say one of the things we do is it's obviously not just raising capital, selling companies or doing IPOs. I mean, having been around for 27 years and and build our own company, think about it, I'm a founder too. I built Etsy Partners, had to build a profitably scale up marketing and sales and technology. And it's it's a real business like anybody else's. It's not a tech company per se, but you have to think about running a business. So but having seen thousands of companies now, like actually done deals for thousand plus companies and seen thousands of other ones, you start to learn a thing or two about like CAC. You start to learn a thing or two about product. You start to learn a thing or two about like how company, you see what, you see more pattern recognition than probably anybody on the planet of what works and what doesn't work. That's just for raising capital, but running companies, right? So we've given a lot of advice to people on on company running, if you will, like a, like a very active board member or friend or advisor or co-founder friend. And so 
And uh, the reason I say that is like when you say things or hear me say things like, oh, let's raise 150 or let's raise a billion. The next thing is that let's just go light it on fire buying fancy furniture, stupid ads, Super Bowl ads. And, and we become real zealots for product. And I was in, in talking to you about your product, by the way, which blown away um, with what you guys have built a puzzle. So here we are. You guys should raise it. it Where's listening to this? Just wire money to not shut up and $5 billion. Hey, we'll get back to the conversation in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey everyone, Eric here. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from our AI and investing cluster of podcasts, to shows that drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, investors, and influencers, like Econ 102 with Noah Smith. We're launching new shows every week, and we're looking for industry-leading sponsors. If you think that might be you and your company, email me at erikaturpentine.co. That's E-R-I-K at turpentine.co, and let's partner together. How do you know what the right amount is? Maybe that's a, an e- a better question. Like the range between 200 million and a billion or 50 and 200. That's a big, it's a big variance. There's, there's, there's not really a right answer. I think obviously the higher the valuation, maybe the more you should raise, right? And then because you're getting less dilution. But like where I was going with the product thing, right? Was one of the things we noticed about Revolut was, and you said it, Nick is just the, the, the most badass, amazing founder of maybe of all times. And and like what we kind of deduced on Revolut was they were building product at such a rapid pace, right? And such incredibly diverse and highly integrated product from building their own money transfer systems and networks to building their own pet insurance company, to building their own e-commerce stores, payments platforms, payroll, small business, money, you name it. But doing it all with the level of integration of and data sharing and 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 um and then one singular beautiful app, right? And then saying, how do you do this in 60 countries, right? And what's the right product to launch in each niche of each country to make sure that that country gets off the ground? And how do you have a philosophy, which they had, and this is something I'm very big on these days of just not spending money on advertising. They're saying the product just has to be so freaking good that everyone uses it and talks about it and it just works incredibly, incredibly well. And that's really what Nick focused on. And then by adding more and more products, so you credit, credit, get network effective data and analytics and, and underwriting and product capabilities that becomes unstoppable. And I, I'm going to get this stat wrong, but like 50% of everyone in Ireland uses Revolut, right? Like 80, like a huge percentage of people in certain countries use Revolut from adults to children to this, that. And so we, what we kind of caught on to and sold investors on was these guys are going to win. There's just no way that the level of energy and, and it's just a matter of time and money. And the more money that they have, these guys will spend it incredibly wisely. They're not going to blow it on marketing. They don't even spend money on marketing, really. They spend money on referral fees and features to, to create virality and things like that. But they have not been until recently. They're really focused on marketing dollars. So. So it was, it was like, who is going to be a really, really good steward of this money and spend it incredibly wisely? And I can't, and I don't want to give any current stats on Revolut, but trust me, this company is going to be big, right? And I'm obviously a big fan of Revolut, right? But like we, we built a model that was 20 years out. So it was, went out to 2041 or 42. And we say, here's how many countries we think they're going to be in. Here's so much SMB, consumer, enterprise. How much lending, how much balance sheet, how much payment processing. And of course, it gets a little fuzzy as you go out 20 years, you can predict. So anyway, investors got really excited and they, they, they agreed. They said, yeah, you're right. This guy and this team, because it's a team, they have an amazing team, is truly building technology that matters at a rapid scale. And no one else is really doing this. Like maybe on a country by country basis, people are building many versions of it, right? But no one's doing that on a completely global basis. And there's so much TAM to create that it, it would say things like, is it possible that there's one company on the planet that actually pulls this off, right? And they're, they're working on it. Let's put it that way. So, uh, so, so, and then you, you build up the 20 year thing. You say like, 
of course, no one's giving you credit. You never get credit for the 20 year model, right? I mean, even Elon Musk never got credit for whatever Tesla was going to be back when he was like raising the B round, right? Or C round, right? But you, but you hope to get as much credit as you can within reason and you give people a good deal and everyone's going to make a lot of money that round. But everyone thought it was overpriced. Like, oh my God, how'd you guys get 33 million? The last round was 5 billion a year ago, right? So it just seems, but like it, I don't think it will be seen as an overpriced round in, in, in today's world. So anyway, it's fun. That was fun. It was so much fun working with him. And there's nobody more demanding on the whole planet. And if anyone didn't need a banker to raise money, it was him, right? But he needed someone to get it done really well. And so he could focus on what he does best, which is building a product and building a company. And we could spend our time raising the capital. So it was a yeah, real pleasure. And it's like, that's what we do in a microcosm for lots of other companies. And do they all become trillion dollar companies, you know, now some sell the next year for twice the price and some become 50 billion or whatever and everything in between. So um, it's so much fun, keeps me young, keeps me working hard. It's, it's a blast. How on that part, not specifically talking about Revolut, but you brought up a really interesting point that I think is probably common amongst a lot of private companies that have huge ambitions in which capital can be an accelerant. How should people think, or how do you think about the d- the decision between sort of growth versus profitability when you're doing something like that? I think you just have to think very intelligently about it, put it that way, right? I mean, I think that w- what's been proven wrong time and time again, and we've been saying this for years, growth at all costs never makes any sense. Where we go back to is always product. You, put, you should put the money into product instead of sales and marketing. And where you end up blowing your company up is sales and marketing typically, right? Because your, your product isn't good enough. You've spent so much money in sales and marketing to get the thing sold that you never make any money, right? So and you have a leaky bucket of customers. So it, it, I don't want to make any too broad of statements, but burning money really, really, really is something you got to be very careful about. You, you need to be highly, highly confident that you're spending money in a way that's going to have a very high ROI. And you cannot be praying that just at the last moment when you need the money that it's there. That's how companies implode, right? Or, or have these huge like down rounds, right? And I would be very cautious about burn, burning money. This, put this way, there's very few businesses where it's winner takes all, right? I mean, there are some, right? Of course, like Amazon's done pretty well, but there's a lot of other e-commerce businesses that done pretty well too, right? So I think people are trying to sprint too fast to become number one. And it's like, it's not all about speed and blitzing and blitz scaling and all that kind of stuff. It's about building a sustainable business and get rich slow, not get rich quick. And and so I think the mistake of overburning and overspending on and clearly bad unit economic situations is not good. People were deluding themselves into, oh, my LTV CAC is really two, but if I cross sell all these products and I predict this over the next 10 years, it's 13. Well, that doesn't mean you have a 13 times LTV to CAC, it means you have a two. And you hope that it's 13. And that's, that's, that's a formula for disaster. It's just got to be smartly done. You're a steward of capital and you need to put the capital work in a way that makes sense and that you don't run out of it. Um, so I think if you have an excess of capital and you can afford to earn it or break even, that's great. I mean, Bezos, I, I think it was him that said profits for people that ran out of great ideas. Right. And I kind of believe that. Right. To some extent, right. If you've got enough good ideas, let's, okay. You, what if he, wanted to make money and didn't build AWS? What if you wanted to make money and didn't go international, right? What if Apple wanted to make money and didn't put five years into developing the iPhone, right? So R&D and product development. And and if you if you are a good allocator of capital, you should be allocating capital. And that's really what CEOs are and founders and boards are allocators of scarce, potentially very scarce capital. Got so many questions we're not going to get to, but so we've got to wrap it up because we're getting towards the end of time. What was your favorite capital raise and why? Probably the 50 bucks I put into FT Partners in 2002 to get my business cards at Kinko's and my computer from Craigslist. And that, that was my best capital raise ever, my own money. But no, I mean, I think like Revolut obviously is way up there for me. And, and more recently, I, I really am excited about the recent ones we've done with Built and 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 tools for humanity with Sam. And I mean, just being associated with that guy and his team, incredible. So yeah, I mean, it's like from the earliest one to the latest ones, you're always good as your last deal. And 
And so we're still cranking out good ones here. So without naming any names, what was one of the biggest red flags? What's a deal you you passed on that you were like, I'm not going to take this? What was the red flag? It's usually founders that are opaque when we're asking questions and think that they're kind of know-it-alls and that you're stupid for not understanding their business without any data or that you should be professing valuations and things like that without any data. We're we're big time data hounds. Like we want to be really accurate with the, the information we put out there and we want to be really smart. We take on a client. Like I said, it would become a little bit like a VC fund. We're really, really, really screening things and only taking in, you know, what we think is the best of the best. And so if we, we find a founder that's unwilling to provide information to us while we're evaluating their deal, they just wants to take the company on and throw it out in the marketplace and pass a big value. We just would never work with a company like that. So it's the red flag is people that are super opaque or think that they that you should just know everything and trust them. I don't think anybody should be trusting anybody really. You should trust but verify, of course. So I think that that's a big red flag for us. I mean, look, we never got involved in any of the crypto messes out there. Never you never had the good feeling about a lot of these types of companies where no audits, things like that. So we, we avoided all crypto messes. We actually have some really, really good blockchain and crypto clients today. So really have avoided many, many, we're very, very, very diligent, I would say, in taking on clients. So that's really important. And what is that you've been doing this for a while? What do you think is one of the biggest changes from when you started FT Partners to today? I mean, the, probably the most important thing for us, and I, I should mention this at the beginning, but all the end is our team. It's taken 20 something years to figure out how to build the team, how to make all the pieces to the F1 car of FT Partners work well, right? I mean, F1 cars take a lot of energy, a lot of time to build and create and tweak. Um, and designing the firm the way we have took time and getting the people in the right seats, getting them trained up, getting them to all work as a team. Because like all the stuff I'm talking about, like there's no miracle. But you can say nothing I've said, there's a miracle pill. Oh, just do a 20 year plan and call Steve and I'll call my friend and we'll give you money. That, that never happens, right? It's, it's, it's a lot of work and, and a lot of teamwork amongst a lot of people around the firm. We've got three offices. We've got five or six different units in the company that all work together. And all we've got people that have been here for 20 years, 10 years, 15 years, doing the same thing over and over again. And we've got people that we just hired two or three years ago as well that are loving it. So as we grew from the front desk person who we love, to the most senior person. I mean, it's a real team. When we talk about the, we go to our offsites, we talk about the FT Partners machine, just like every little piece of the firm and how it all, all the gears come together to make it work really, really well. Is it easier now or harder now than it was when you first started to raise capital for clients? Well, it, it kind of depends on the moment in time in the market to some extent, but I'd say in general, it's easier now because we've been doing it for so long. Whatever, every, the thing I pride myself on is every mistake we ever made, everyone makes mistakes every day, right? You, you, if you learn from them, like an AI machine, you eventually become very, very good at what you're doing, right? And if every company is doing that, but if everyone's operating in their little tiny silo and no one deal ever has any learnings that affects another deal or a person, then, then you just one random deal after the other. We've been the opposite of that. The network effect of the people that we've met and the experience we've gotten the deals that we've seen get done or not get done, the valuations and all that information is kept in the collective brain of FT partners. It's impossible to replicate and we document it all. So these days, it's a lot easier to raise capital and to win the assignments than it was a long time ago because we had no credibility in the early days. I was 32 years old and looked like I was 22 probably. And so it's been a long time and, and yeah, our team is just incredible. So yeah, I mean, they, 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 we all make it look way too easy, but it's, it's actually really hard. Everyone here works extremely hard sacrifices their bodies their their lives and, and their families and stuff to make these deals happen the right way and for the clients and the clients really appreciate that i mean like we're yeah we're at our clients weddings and vice versa and there's there's a lot of love what's next for ft partners and how can people get a hold of you just continuing to be incredibly loyal to our clients and get get great deals done and building the franchise around the world. Like I said, we're now in six, seven continents in terms of deals and opening up offices around the world. And so I think the world, I was like, there's many other more philanthropic things that we're doing that we could talk about. But like, I think the world needs a, a global version of FT Partners. It doesn't, it, it, the only firm in the world that's like it, to be able to have fintech branded all around the world, connecting everybody up. I mean, like, for example, one of the things I'm super proud of right now, we're doing a big event in New York City. We're inviting 
30 companies of the FinTech Africa's ecosystem over to New York and having hundreds of investors show up from New York, San Francisco, London, and saying, let's, let's get the best entrepreneurs in Africa or amongst the best and the best investors. Let's get them all in one room in three days in New York City and create something that would have never happened before. People that have never would have met before are going to get together and make things happen. So we're bringing the world closer together. We're not going to end wars or save lives in terms of bringing the ecosystems together and making things collide that never would have collided before. We're going to do the same thing with the Middle East. We have amazing clients in, in Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Middle East and Turkey and other great places. We'll be bringing them to the U.S. We're bringing the U.S. companies over to Europe. So we're just doing as much as we can to mash everything up and create more and more of a human and technical network amongst all these companies and investors. So so it's, it's really amazing. It's like so many amazing clients in Africa, in India, in Saudi Arabia and, and Dubai and, and, and just selling your company in Japan right now. I mean, so to me, it's been like so much fun building thing, the thing around the world and being, these dragged me to places I would have never been and you know, got me to meet people in different cultures and bring people together through money. What's exactly. <laughs> I think the head of data science from AngelList said, as he looked back on his portfolio, there's three types of investments. There's deep tech infrastructure, there's fintech, and then there's companies that lose money. So if you need to raise money and you're building something huge and ambitious, go check out FG Partners. Steve is the man. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, buddy. See you, Sasha. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Turpentine Finance. Share with your executive team, direct reports, friends, and family. And if you want to support the show, the best ways are to leave a review wherever you're listening and subscribe. Turpentine Finance is part of Turpentine, the podcast network behind Moment of Zen, Turpentine VC, Age of Miracles, and more. Shows for experts by experts in tech.